السلام عليكم الحمد لله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a blessed praise we send peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his family his companions and those who follow them until the end of time there is a lot to say, you know, in such a short amount of time, so I'll try to keep it brief and focused. Uh, but first, let's extend our gratitude to all of the volunteers uh, who have worked uh, diligently and with great dedication. Uh, those of you who are here from the volunteers, uh, personally, I would like to thank you um, and ask Allah to bless you, inshallah. Secondly, we want to thank ICNA and MASS uh, two great organizations, two historic organizations who continue to be extremely relevant to the lives of American Muslims, whether it's through, whether it's, someone has really big hands because like one person does it and everybody hears it, mashallah. Whether it's through their, their dedication to youth work through young Muslims, neighbor nets across the country, YM for young men and young women tends to be increasingly important uh, as Islamophobia arises, the hatred and bigotry towards Muslims. It's important for our young people to have vehicles and opportunities for expression and identity. Same also for mass youth who since the early days of Islam's inception uh, within uh, uh, certain communities in this country continue to show a great dedication to your children uh, whether uh, male or female. We, we are faced with an incredible set of challenges in the coming uh, few years. 2016, I think is, people are saying is like the worst year uh, in history. Some people are saying, I doubt it, but that's what they're saying. And as Muslims, we have a number of incredible opportunities to take on a number of incredible challenges. So what I'd like to talk to you about is really three or four things we can think about to take home from tonight. Uh, as American Muslim community. The first and very important thing is that each and every one of us has a responsibility to have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody can do that for you. Nobody can live that relationship for you. It's something that has to come from you. The Quran says very beautifully, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى Right? No soul can carry the burden of another soul. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inni ma'akum la in aqamtum salah. I'm with you as long as you establish prayer. Allah says in the Quran, Fadkurni adkurukum. Remember me and I will remember you. Each and every one of us in the coming days, as this year winds down, we should make sure that we don't trump our souls and maintain a strong relationship with our Lord. Finding the halawa of ibadah, the sweetness of worship, the beauty of worship, and creating that intimacy. So no matter what happens, whether you experience the family challenges of Prophet Adam, whether you experience the mockery of Prophet Nuh, whether you experience the loneliness of Sayyidina Yusuf, whether you have to speak against power like Sayyidina Musa, whether you have to balance opulence like Sayyidina Dawood and Suleiman, whether you experience as a woman the shame thrown at Sayyidina Maryam, whether you experience the stress of Sayyidina Isa, whether you experience the incredible test faced by the Prophet Muhammad remember that the greatest asset you have into taking on the challenges of the dunya is the Lord of this dunya. So find that sweetness and that worship in faith. If you're young and you're cutting yourself, find your value through worship. If you're struggling with drug addiction, turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If your marriage is on the rocks, turn back to having that relationship, not necessarily to fix those challenges, to, to bring you a sense of balance and equilibrium. Whether you fear for family members in Gaza or Aleppo or Yemen or anywhere in the world, find solace 
and worshiping Malikul Mulk Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The second thing that we really need to consider as a community and we cannot neglect is that the age is changing. You know, in the 80s and the 90s and prior to that in the black community in this country under the leadership of incredible black Imams like Sheikh Hassan Tawfiq, who is in Harlem, Imam W.D. Muhammad, Rahimahullah, who lived here for years in Chicago. Times have changed. And the necessity for activism and the need for engagement has never been greater than now. We find in the Quran that people who have a spiritual relationship with God but fail to calibrate that spirituality in their experiences being raised as God's servants. The people of knowledge and faith are raised. Allah says, we raise who we want. Allah says about Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Subhanallah asra bi abdihi. On the night of Isra, Allah took a servant and raised him and gave him spiritual enlightenment and honored him as we have been honored by God to grow spiritually. We have to recalibrate that as thankfulness to God for looking for the most after the most marginalized in and outside of our communities. We cannot simply have spiritual experiences that lift our spirits and fail to translate that into lifting the plight of the poor, the homeless, the needy, the immigrants, the refugees. Before we can have sanctuary cities, we have to have sanctuary souls. Before we can truly be dedicated to those around us who are most marginalized and under the impending administration, we know that it will only increase. We have to calibrate our spiritual experiences, knowing that God has raised us, as he says in the Quran, to look after and raise those who have been let down and underserved by society. That's why the Prophet وسلم, says, Khayru nas man nas. The best of you are those who help others. And the Prophet وسلم, he said that every creation is dependent on Allah. And the best of creation are those who look after Allah's dependence. The first hadith that we learned from our teachers, recently I was reading with a sheikha, a woman scholar from Morocco. She's over 98 years old, Sheikha Kinza. And the first hadith that we learn, Ar-Rahimun yarhamuhum ar-Rahman irhamu man fil ard yarhamakum man fi sama The merciful ones, God is merciful to them. Be merciful to those in the heavens and those in the earth. Be merciful to those in the earth and the one in the heavens will be merciful to you. We have to recognize the power of intersectionality in this country and we have to seek to foster relationships with other religious communities, ethnic communities, the immigrants in this country, people of other orientations, where those intersections are so powerful that we cannot neglect to exercise the option to participate in ta'awanu ala al-birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awanu ala al-ithmi wa al-udwan. Many of us are Star Wars fans and we know that Princess Leia she died, I believe, yesterday, Carrie Fisher. Maybe some people are saying, why would he start talking about Star Wars? Because you should go and read how Carrie Fisher, when she had the opportunity to defend Islam and Muslims, she did so. To show you that there are allies in the society who are dedicated and willing, not just because we're Muslim, but because it is the right thing to do to look after this community. So for that reason, as a piece of advice, our activist community and our religious leadership, you have to begin to sit at the table and exchange ideas and learn each other's language and understand strategically about partnerships 
that are needed for the, 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 the legacy, the security, the honorability of our community and others. Freedom is not a monopoly. Justice is not a monopoly. Honor is not a monopoly. These belong to everyone in this country. And it's our job now because God has chosen us to face these incredible odds. And he would not put us somewhere if we were not ready for it. But we can't do it alone. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Yarullahi ma'al jama'a, Allah is with the group. And we have incredible lessons from this in our Quran as we look at marginalized communities in this country. We should find great empathy for them because our own prophets, every prophet was an immigrant and many of the prophets were refugees. But if you look at the life of Prophet Yusuf, you find someone who lived the life of really every single marginalized community you can think of. Number one, he was abused as a child. Number two, he was homeless. Number three, he was trafficked. Number four, he was the victim of sexual harassment. Number five, he served in the prison industrial complex. He worked and he wasn't paid. He was an immigrant. He was a refugee. He spoke a different language. He was a different color. Go back and read the 12th chapter of the Quran and find the intersectionality of people in this country and the story of Prophet Yusuf. Added to that is our uncompromising, unapologetic dedication to black America. The Muslim community has to deal with its own issues when it comes to black America. And as a white man, you know, I, I can only say that I stand as an unconditional spiritual ally to the black community. That's all I can say. And then my job as a convert, a white convert, is to calibrate an Islam as black brothers and sisters did for hundreds of years in this country, calibrated an Islam that resonated so deeply with the black community. As Reverend Al Sharpton said, you will be hard pressed to find a black home in America where there's not someone named Rukeya, Ahmed, Jamal, or Muhammad. The foundations of our communities, whether they are in Bridgeview or Masjid Da'wah in Inglewood, rest on the struggles and foundational building of unsung black heroes in the Muslim community. People like Imam Jamil El Amin, people like Imam W.D. Muhammad, people like Sister Aisha, and others who laid down incredible sacrifice so that you and I could be here today. But our job, my job as a white convert is to say, if my black American brothers and sisters spent years passionately, passionately crafting a theology that resonated amongst black people, it is upon white converts in particularly to craft an Islam that will remind greater white America of their collective humanity and scold the notions of privilege and bring into discipline the gloating that we're seeing from bigots to remind them that the teachings of God always start out with Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, mercy and grace, and continue by saying, Ya ayyuhan nas, O humanity. The last piece that I'll talk about and I'll finish now, inshallah, well, there's two, is you young people in the audience, let me hear you. I see some ladies and brothers that are like 50 and they're like. You're still young if you feel young. But my experience over the last year on, on Snapchat with your kids, right? I got all kinds of stories I could tell, names and addresses. But you can read about it in the book. Just joking. Delete. But my experience with young American Muslims, regardless of their ethnic background, is that you are really the future of not only Islam, but you are the future of an incre increasingly diverse America. Your responsibility is a great responsibility. You can make mistakes, 
you can screw up. Islam will never turn its back on you. You may fall and you may slip, but I as an Imam, and I know Imam Zaid and others, are here to tell you that we have your back, that we are supported. But parents, every time people come and parents, they ask me, you know, tell me about this Snapchat. And then they say their kid's name. You're like, why are you telling me your kid's name? Like, what are you trying to find out? But every day around 500 questions, largely from American Muslim youth. And let me just say that when parents ask me, like, are the questions really bad? Do they send you dirty pictures? Like, dirty pictures? What kind of Snapchat do you have? But just let me say this honestly, that around 90% of all of the questions that I receive endear me to love this young generation and to tell you that they are nothing but a ball of awesome. They are going to do great things in this country. They are going to heal a country rocked by racism. And they are going to collectively contribute to the struggles not only of people here but people overseas. The last thing is that as we move forward, it's important that we recognize our need for unity. And what we mean by unity is that we don't have to agree on everything because that's not unity. But we have to agree in a way which our agreements and our disagreements reflect our collective love for each other. The challenges ahead will not matter if you are Salafi, you are Sufi, you are Mass, you are Ikna, you are from the Dar al-Islam, you are Jamaat Tabliq. It doesn't matter because in the eyes of Islamophobia, we are all collectively a problem. And when we are seen as a collective problem, the way to push that back is to be a collective, to be one, Kalbunyan in Marsus. With that in mind, I would like to invite the leaders of major Muslim organizations in this country who have come together, regardless of the platform, to show you, not just to tell you, that they are working together to create strategy and vision for the future that will protect our rights as American Muslims and the rights of other Americans. So I invite them to come out now, insha'Allah ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. Stay and listen to what they have to say. Shirkwan wa salamu alaykum. So I come on back. Um, the other thing, there was two things I forgot to say. Now I'm really over time, officially. Number one is, everyone needs to be donating to care. Everyone should be signing up at least as care volunteers or Islamic relief volunteers, right? Today, finally, the Obama administration figured it out about Palestine, kind of. But we will not stop until Palestine is honored. People in Palestine have a right to live in freedom and justice. And the same for our Syrian family, our Yemeni family, our Kashmiri family. But if we don't organize and unify, we will not be able to accomplish that. Second thing is, we have Brother Melvin here. Uh, Melvin's mother actually became Muslim a year ago. Uh, so let's give it up for his mother. It's your sister? Yeah. What's her name? Andrea. Andrea. And his sister Andrea is here. Uh, Melvin would like to accept Islam. <laughs> Hi, Melvin, just uh, repeat after me. Uh, Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha, Ilaha, Illa, Ila, Allah, Allah, Wa, Wa, Ashhadu, Ashhadu, Anna, Anna, Muhammadan, Muhammadan, Abduhu, Abduhu, Wa, Wa, Rasul, Rasul, Rasul. I testify. We do it in English too. Well, they gave you the disco. <laughs> this is the first time I've seen a disco light shahada. Wow. Say it in English. Uh, I testify. I testify that there's no God. That there's no God except Allah. Except Allah. And I testify. 
and I testify that Muhammad, that Muhammad is his servant, is his servant and, messenger. and messenger. Congrats, man. Psych.